All right. Good afternoon to those of us on the East Coast. Good morning to those internationally. Good evening to other friends joining us. Welcome and thank you so much for joining our session. We're so grateful today to speak to you all about uh, how Nestle and the Nestle Pride Alliance took COVID and intersectionality head on and how we've adapted to an ever-changing landscape as well as tell you a little bit about who we are. Before we get started, let's all use the Zoom chat box to interact today. We want to hear from you. Um, so to start out, we're a little over halfway through Out and Equal 2020, albeit a very different experience than years prior. We want to know from you what's one key takeaway you've learned from a session or a plenary to go back to your ERGs, BRGs, companies, communities, and adapt. Before, as we go through our presentation, at the end of each section, we'll take a glance at the Q&As and see if there are any questions related to that section and answer those on the spot. And then we'll open it up to Q&A at the end. So if you have a question throughout, don't hesitate to jump in and we'll be monitoring the Q&A chat box as we go through. So today we're going to talk about who we are as the Nestle Pride Alliance, what we've been up to, how we do what we're doing and how we do everything related to our mission and values. Ultimately, how have we shifted to promote intersectionality in this ever-changing landscape? And then we'll wrap up with what did 2020 teach us as it's been a very tumultuous year, but nonetheless an intriguing one. So I'm going to turn it over to Harrison to talk a little bit about the Pride Alliance itself at Nestle. Hey everybody, how's it going? My name's Harrison. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I sit in Arlington, Virginia, where Nestle is headquartered, um, along with a couple, one of my other friends on this call. Um, day to day, I, we, I heard last year at Out and Equal, someone used the term day jobs and gay jobs. So um, my day job um, is a public affairs analyst. Um, in that capacity, I work with our lobbying team on communicating on policy internally and externally, um, and identify identifying key policy we want to support in states where we have footprint or nationally, um, including around DNI and workforce equity building. Um, next slide, please, Nolan. Um, one of the things in the chat that I immediately drawn to, and we'll get to it, I know, but um, that community is going to get us through, or connections are going to get us through these times. And I just want to upfront say that is a huge theme of what we're going to talk about today. So let me preface it with this. This is the mission of the Nestle Pride Alliance that we've identified. We're a very new ERG. Nestle is very old, 150 years old, I believe. And um, we are two years old for an ERG. So we've done a lot in a little bit amount of time um, and figured out how to harness these 150 year old systems and teams to our advantage, right? Um, our overall goal is championing, championing, celebrating and supporting our LGBTQ colleagues to live their most authentic lives at work and in our communities um, and empower collaboration and greater business contributions by creating an inclusive environment for all, right? So we've kind of framed our mission in these three boxes. So winning with LGBTQ consumers is on top because first and foremost, our business is driven to uh, deliver against consumers' expectations. Um, and that is what we call our true north. Our second mission is to champion DNI and Nestle, and that's kind of across the board, fully recognizing um, where we are as an LGBTQ community. And in you know, in Arlington, we sit in a different spot, and we'll go through that. But um, you know, we're we're further along the, in the progressive process as other uh, minority groups. So we want to use that to our advantage. Um, and then the third element is driving community involvement. So thinking about the communities where we have a presence, because we have a very significant footprint, and using that presence to our um, advantage. Um, on the right, you'll see our ways of winning is what we call them at Nestle. You could think of them as ways of, uh, ways of working as well. Um, those are rooted in speed, agility, collaboration, and you'll see courage is in bold. That's kind of what we've identified as our key area because a lot of what it takes to, I think, you know, be an ERG, but be a, a new and fresh ERG is kind of having the courage to say, we want to do this. Um, and recognizing no one in the room is necessarily going to stop you, but no one in the room is also going to tell you what to do. So it's having the courage to just step up and do it. And, um, you know, if someone has a problem with it, we can <laughs> talk about it later, but kind of just breaking through those barriers. Next slide, please, Nolan. Um, this is who's represented on the call, and this looks at our corporate sort of footprint uh, writ large. So um, Seattle, Washington is where our coffee 
partner's business sits. Um, they're represented on this call by a wonderful, uh, wonderful team member. Cleveland is um, where our foods division sits. That's Nolan, you can see him shaking probably. That's where he sits and helps lead. And then Arlington is our corporate functions as well as some of our other brands just across the river from DC. That's the Roslyn skyline where I'm sitting. It's crazy being in the office, but that's where I am. Um, this year for us and for everyone on the call, so I won't pretend that we're unique in this, was an unusual pride. Um, it's super unusual pride and, and place to find yourself as a new ERG, as many of you might know. So last year for context, we were just kind of making a splash with pride celebrations in those three major cities. And we were still finding each other, the people on this call today. We were, we were still kind of identifying who our equals were in Cleveland or Seattle or Arlington. Um, and so starting to come together have a bigger splash. We had a huge success with that. Um, you know, we had our executive leaders come out um, at the different campuses. You know, people were posting on LinkedIn, what a great time they were bringing their kids. And, you know, everyone walked away from that experience saying, what can we do next year? Like, how can it be bigger? Well, we had lots of plans to make it bigger. Um, and in some ways it, it was bigger, but in, in different ways. Um, and, you know, COVID really threw an early wrench in our plans. I, you know, DC Pride was canceled a couple months out, um, which kind of gave us time to reevaluate and think about how we can still have a splash as a relatively new ERG um, amidst social distancing, which has been going on for so long now. Um, so our response was really to have sort of a cross-campus Pride that was more focused in education and bringing in speakers and, and, and more allies into the conversation, right? Because we have a unique opportunity where everyone was sitting at home to say, okay, here's an excuse to sit at home and talk to your coworkers, but it doesn't have to be about work or a meeting you don't want to be in. Let's talk about pride and let's do different activities that are around pride, like trivia. And we'll go through some of those, um, some of those little later. You know what we what we came to find out from the COVID situation was that whereas a year two years ago now we were doing one off pride programming, you know, as campuses we kind of came together and said, look, we have, you know, these 50 really engaged members that we can identify of pride and you know you have a hundred, like how can we come together, have those people invite two extra people and then have, you know, an event with 500 people on a call, um, you know, more or less. So we kind of developed this national strategy. It unified our campuses and it has allowed us still in the wake of that to make bigger splashes. So that's not going backwards, right? So COVID has kind of enabled us to do that in a way. Um, and it's broadened our reach, right, to employee bases. And that's kind of the, the key item here. Um, we're still kind of working out how to engage those field and remote employees, but when everyone's remote, <laughs> um, you find those remote employees more, right? Because word gets out in different ways through digital mechanisms and whatnot. So that that was a that was an interesting unlock for us. Um, you know, I would definitely be remiss if we didn't mention, of course, the summer of Black Lives Matter and the social unrest that we saw in the um, wake of the George Floyd murder, which was you know a week a week and a couple of days right out from June first. Um, you know, part of planning virtually involved a lot of you know, recording videos and having a huge rollout and making a big splash, you know, um, messages from our executive sponsors. And we acted really quickly to sort of say this feels wrong and um, just inappropriate for sort of what we're, we're going for. And if you remember our mission statement, it was to spread DNI across the board. Um, it wasn't just for LGBTQ issues. So you know, we really quickly sort of decided without any pushback, I know amongst the people on this call that, you know, we needed to scale back the first two weeks of June and make room for our friends at the Nestle Black Employee Association who really needed the energy and attention from allies that would otherwise be paying attention to pride, right? Um, so we reached out to them early and said, please let us know like what we can do to help, um, but we wanna ease off the gas. You know, one of the, we didn't stop there. And I think one of the most successful things we did was we were the first, um, I would say, business entity even before our leaders to post in our internal um, channels, you know, that Black Lives Matter and this is why we're, we're doing this. Um, it put us in an interesting position in that I think our leaders were still kind of scrambling to understand, you know, like what the sentiment was internally. But in us talking to our members, we understood, right, and honestly, just being on the internet understood that this was, you know, a different, a different sort of uh, time and we, it warranted a different response, right? So that earned us a credibility that I think um, if we hadn't done, it would have just kind of been hollow. Um, and and that's, that's carried waves. So, you know, right off the bat, we 
like I said, we reached out to our Black Employee Association, but then we also said, you know, we would love to bring our resources to the table, sort of like the campuses did with COVID, and, you know, have a town hall on allyship and talking about, you know, wasn't what's entailed of, of being an ally and, 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 you know, to have a discussion about intersectionality that, you know, had it not been for Black Lives Matter falling exactly when it did, you know, the, the summer of unrest, then, you know, we might not have had that otherwise at, during the Pride Month because of, you you know, where our general employee population is in that dialogue. So we were able to sort of speed up that goal um, exponentially, right? And so now our conversations are still rooted in this, you know, lens of intersectionality, talking about what we can also do and how we can transfer LGBTQ equality to sort of racial equality. So you know, the last bullet I have on here is doing that really shifted our ERG from being a sort of a employee advocate and kind of looking down to being a leader for the business and almost putting pressure up. Um, and I think that's still uh, having ripple effects. It gives us credibility. You know, I know some people on this call can tell you that leaders have reached out to us and asked us um, for help uh, informing some some messaging and, you know, some, some of the softer touch points they have with their like division town halls. Um, and, it, and it's paid dividends and we're not going back, right? Like that's the best, the best part about the whole thing is we've leaned into it. Um, we've set the precedent and, and it'll stay for, for prides to come. So I know I've taken up a lot of time. There's big subjects on this slide, but um, I would love to turn it over and or field any questions if there were any good ones. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions, Harrison, but um, there is definitely resonance. I want to back up a little bit. I think um, there's a lot of good ideas that people have uh, gathered throughout the conference so far. And I think some of what we're talking about in today's conversation is going to reflect a lot of those. Mm -hmm. And then we have a couple of comments about how there are other ERGs as well who've had to readjust um, their approach based on COVID and BLM. And how important DNI is for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just one point too to kind of build on what Harrison was saying of the shifting the status of an ERG from an employee advocate to a business leader. David's going to talk a little bit about our programming in a moment, but we were fortunate to have a consumer panel with some consumer panel experts on the LGBTQ plus community a few weeks ago at Nestle. And one of the things that really stuck out to me and I think our, our ERG in general at Nestle was um, it was someone from Nike and they said, you have to shift the paradigm that an ERG is a volunteer opportunity, but instead it's a business critical opportunity. The things that we do as a part of our ERG at Nestle and all of you do at your respective ERGs and BRGs is not just a volunteer effort. It's shifting the way a corporate culture is structured and ultimately how comfortable people feel at work to live their true selves, which as Harrison noted is part of our mission statement as I'm sure many of you share. So we'll go on to David to talk a little bit about programming. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is David Fox. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm a senior HR business partner at Nestle. I also co-lead uh, along with Harrison, who you just heard from, uh, the Pride Alliance in our Arlington, Virginia headquarters. And so a little bit about me kind of professionally is, you know, I'm really driven by, by working with leaders um, to really unlock kind of team potential uh, and also enjoy working, you know, on different projects uh, with a lot of ambiguity, especially around like mergers and acquisitions um, with a special lens towards talent and change and organizational design. Um, but today I am excited to talk about the programming um, that we've done this year. And, uh, you know, just really talking kind of about the, the broad umbrellas uh, about uh, the policies that we also impacted as well. So as you see on the screen here, we had three um, major programming themes. So um, again, all driven by the, the whole piece around engagement and intersectionality. <clears throat> and just as a reminder, uh, we are in our, our second year here as, as an ERG, so very much um, you know, and, and still in that building phase um, and, and really in this evolution. And I'm just, you know, very, very thrilled about how it's kind of all, all come together. Uh, but first, in terms of the, the key programming themes was we really leaned in this year on, on learning from our community partners. So that's things like Out and Equal, you know, HRC, Quality Virginia. Um, it really, that's all about taking that external lens 
uh, and inviting in these amazing organizations, uh, you know, that, that are in this world day to day um, that can really bring kind of the latest and greatest relevant content. So it wasn't just completely on us as, as leads or on the, you know, the, the internal team to come up with the programming, which I think is, is really key. Uh, second, you know, coming together while apart, I mean, I think it's a pretty, pretty big um, theme this year. And it's all about driving that, um, you know, cohesion while being socially distanced with the craziness that that is 2020. And, you know, there've been some some purely fun social activities like the the trivia, but then you know other areas where we engaged in in virtual community efforts um, through different donations and and giving a voice and um, really kind of highlighting some of the different uh, volunteer groups that that we like to work with. And then lastly, of course, it comes down to showing our pride. So you know, really, really important to, to fly that, that inclusive pride flag on our campuses, you know, driving the campaign around pronouns in our email signatures, and then just also driving that, uh, those authentic stories in our external social media, um, which gives voice to, to our um, employees and the people we work with. All right, so on the next slide, um, just to highlight some of the, the programming, you know, that, that I think we really um, increased awareness and, and allyship here. So um, I've heard, of course, in, in some of the different sessions that I've attended throughout Equal, yeah, there, there's um, a few different thoughts on, on the exhaustive Zoom meetings, um, you know, as a way to, to build that, that culture. But I, I really think that um, kind of where we are and what we're trying to accomplish across the, the you know, the, the different campuses and breaking down those silos that we sometimes default to, it actually really worked for us. And, um, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our engagements, of course, being socially distanced were, were virtual and, and on, um, you know, things like Zoom, but, but for us, it didn't really take away from, from what we were trying to build with that, that cohesion as a group. But what you're seeing on the slide here first, really want to point out the, um, as an example, Equality Virginia, but some of the other groups that we partner with, like the uh, Sustainable Food Policy Alliance, and in working with organizations uh, and kind of putting our name behind some of the, the big things that, that they support as well, um, things like the Virginia Values Act, which recently passed, and uh, the Equality Act. Uh, you know, I think we really see that as a way that we're able to you know, spread, spread the, the good things that we're able to do, you know, across and outside of, of just our campuses. So, you know, we have employees everywhere and, and really um, using our, our voice and, you know, cutting through any kind of red tape that we can to, to get Nestle's name behind, you know, the, the really important things that we have um, to, to support, you know, whether it be legislation or um, you know, some of these other pieces is just something that has, has really resonated with our employees, uh, you know, including our allies, and something that I really think um, earned us a, a spot at the, at the table of, of just that, that visibility piece, uh, both as Nestle and as, as an ERG. So uh, I think that was a key part of our programming and a key part of, you know, once when we signed on to some of these different things, we made sure to also bring in those community partners and, and that they could highlight, you know, the importance of what they're driving towards. And so, you know, again, we give that visibility. Secondly, looking at uh, what you see here on the slide, the, the Spill the Tea webinar series. Um, so that was a really important part around just really driving that, that like business acumen and driving that understanding of the LGBTQ consumer. Um, you know, which it really resonates, of course, with with a lot of our employees and that we kind of came to that by surveying our, our Pride Alliance members. And um, it really came out loud and clear that 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 really creates some of that relevance to for the audience to bring in, you know, the facts around the consumer and some of those case studies. And so we, we brought in some different companies that, um, you know, do this to, to a really high degree and, and also want to learn from their journey as, as well. And so you know, I think that was a key part of our programming that um, just truly resonated with our group. And, and it really brings both the facts and then the kind of the outcome of, of how um, groups use their understanding of the, the LGBTQ consumer. And, you know, I, th I think that that was a big part um, that really resonated. So moving on to the next slide here, more on our programming. Um, you know, we had a, a lot of different uh, discussions really around, you know, relating to the use of pronouns, um, the significance of the Title VII ruling, um, you know, real, how, how we engage uh, community and, and allies 
um, which, which we know is important for our, our growth as well. And, you know, the, the piece there on the modernizing the language around the benefits. So this doesn't necessarily fit um, like traditional programming, but, but I wanted to highlight this in, in this section because, um, you know, one thing that we did is, is we, we have had some pretty top tier benefits. Um, especially in the, the transgender space. But um, unfortunately, our language just didn't really um, match that. And in fact, um, it was referenced in our materials as treatment for gender, gender identity disorder. And, you know, when Pride Alliance members saw that, that was something that was really striking and was something that we um, did not you know, want to, to have stand. And so we really, really quickly worked with our, our benefits group to, to modernize the language and to ensure that, you know, nothing, <laughs> nothing is stated as a disorder there. Um, and, and then we, we made sure, you know, of course, there's a work that goes into working with benefits to, to change that. But then if you do that work, but then don't actually tell the story, then you know I think you really lose out on on a key piece there. So you really got to tell your audience what you did with the with um, you know the the information and what you did and and how you brought that um, kind of to the forefront. So we made sure to to highlight for that for our um, for our group and then also sent that out in uh, what you're seeing there went out to all employees um, to to make sure that there's there's that awareness. And so you know I think if we also go to the the next slide. The, the critical nature of engagement outside of, of June. So we really do not want to, um, or something I think that we all agreed on as the, the leadership team was, we have to drive these engagements and we have to drive the visibility and representation outside of June. And, you know, it, it's really, it, it, important for, um, as, as Nolan mentioned um, earlier, just a couple of weeks ago, we had our consumer panel um, where we brought in those those key speakers, and that was actually one of our biggest events of the year. And we had spent a lot of time um, hyping that up, you know, throughout the year. And yeah, you know, I, I think it's just important, as you'll see, um, kind of on that graph on the on the right, uh, you know, across the summer months, um, you know, based on our programming and based on our, our communication that we went out with, you know, we we really did um, drive a lot of engagement that we measure through um, workplace, you know, by, by Facebook, um, which is where we kind of drive some of that that conversation. And, you know, it's, it's just so important that, and we heard that loud and clear from all of our members, that we need to really elevate the conversation. Um, and we found really key ways to do that out, outside of June. And that's going to be something that that we continue to, to move forward with. And so if we look at the last slide here, um, thinking about the key takeaways. So clearly um, around the driving engagement, as I just mentioned, it, this cannot be just a, a, a June thing. This, you can't start and stop the, the conversation just in that one month. Um, and you know, that, that's gonna be key to, of course, talking about that with employees and with leadership, but then also you know, externally um, connecting. And then, you know, driving that that broader uh, audience engagement. So for us in our kind of journey, that was, you know, the the all virtual programming actually did did work really well. And we were able to come together as one Nestle, you know, more than than we have previously. And, and then that's also aided by the the courageous discussion. So making sure that we're not shying away from any, any topics or, um, you know, making sure that we're we're really kind of hitting it, hitting everything head on, and making sure that we're finding that that relevance uh, within the the community. And I think that again also kind of shows the the growth in the interest um, in, in our group for this previous year. Uh, and then really, what what didn't work? So to be honest, there there is red tape um, in working internally on some of these process changes. So you know, when we we saw the the benefits piece, and and we saw that that language. Um, sometimes the, the whole machine of, of running everything through uh, the, the massive um, company can take a, a little bit of time. And so, you know, we've really identified, I think, as a leadership team, those key areas and those key people that we need to engage um, so that we can continue to, to drive speed when it comes to some of these changes that we like to see, but then also having that courage um, to, to make the changes that we can um, kind of ourselves uh, when possible. And then lastly, kind of what didn't work is trying to run too many events by committee. Uh, I think there's 
a lot of events that if they're if they're really big and and cut cross campus i think it is very helpful to to have your representatives to make sure that um of course there's a, a generic presentation that that would make a lot of sense across but that each campus has some some representation or you know remote folks have some representation there um, to make sure that really speaks to, to that audience uh, but i think it's it's really making sure that every person that is a part of putting on some of these events have a real point and purpose and can, um, can really kind of add that specific piece without trying to uh, run everything through a large committee. So those are my, my key pieces. Are there any questions that I can answer? Yeah, there's actually plenty of engagement and a few questions. Um, the two questions that I'm seeing here, there are things that we've all talked about. Um, the first one is, do we look for opportunities for product campaigns for Pride Month, um, LTOs, special varieties, commercials? Yeah, so it sounds like they're jumping ahead to the next section already. That's right. And it's so good. That's such a good, good intro. <laughs> Maybe we should have started with that one. We, oh, sure, Nolan, sure. Um, the second question, I think this may be um, one to answer here, if, if we're okay with it, is what do we do to include um, manufacturing members, people in the factories and distribution centers who work on the floor and in different things? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, but then, of course, I want to open it up to, to the rest of the panelists here. But, you know, I, I think one, one key piece of engagement uh, across, you know, many sites and across the different shifts, I, I think we're, we're two-pronged approach. Uh, first, you know, when we, um, you know, when, when we send out swag that we have for, um, you know, maybe like Pride Month t-shirts, uh, you know, some of the different branded things that we do uh, made sure that that we also sent um sent some of those to those those key factory sites um and there was definitely interest there and we, we got that interest really early on we knew we wanted to engage so uh, i think that was an important part so that you know everyone really feels engaged in that way and then also um just just from my my vantage point as a, a business partner hr business partner i uh, pulled the uh, HR business partners from across those different sites together and gave them a early look at um, you know some of the the different programming and the the key things that we're trying to accomplish throughout the year as a Pride Alliance and really leverage uh, the HR business partners there as um, as allies in this in this journey that we're on and so making sure that they you know had had the right language that they they felt that they could really speak to it and that. Um, there was that line of communication, which I think is, is really important. Anything else to add from the rest of the panelists there? No, I, one thing I would mention, because I, someone asked, I also saw someone asked if we fly the pride flag year round or if companies do, and then I can like also tie these two questions together for Nestle. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has been super effective in engaging our um, work uh, manufacturing sites and employees there is distributing these, I have one on my badge, these Nestle's Got Pride um, badges on. Harrison, you've gone on mute. I don't know how that happened. Okay, sorry. Um, I don't know what you got, but I have a Nestle's Got Pride badge in case you missed that part. Um, and it has been a very successful way, like shockingly and like the most simple thing ever because, you know, that's not very expensive or a big lift, but, you know, we sort of shipped them to, I think what we did was we posted right in our internal channel that's workplace right. and said, hey, we have these, like, let us know if your campuses would like some. This is how I really got to know Ash when she asked for about I think like 1800 of them or something, but um, yeah. And, but then we started getting them from our manufacturing facilities and those people started, you know, posting them on, you know, on our workplace channels and they would, you know, put them in the conference rooms and let people have them, you know, have them as they came through the day. So that was a super sort of effective way to one, engage our remote and also just like manufacturing site employees. And then also to like fly the pride flag year round. Um, one piece of feedback we get a lot for the, um, from the recruiting team is when people used to come and interview in the building, they would always be struck by the fact that everyone, most people had a like Nestle's Got Pride badge on the backside of their, um, backside of their regular badge. So I know that's someone right. asked one more time to see it, but um, that's it. So it doubles as a doubles as a regular badge. That's me. Um, and it's just an awesome little way to show your pride. So just a cute, a cute pointer. 
little trinkets are yeah usually a ton of traction a ton of traction on that <laughs> it really is i'm going to say uh coffee partners which is the division that i represent we're a new addition to nestle and having working with our uh, with harrison to get those badges and having our leaders just add them it's such a low lift for like the president of a division to tack this onto their badge and seeing that on stage at when they are in town halls or doing company-wide presentations that really has gone a long way so totally uh, there's, there's a ton of engagement on similar badges at cisco rainbow lanyards which yes that's the other thing we've considered um, and another quick question before we move on to the next section. Um, how do we deal with time zone differences? Yeah, I can take a stab at that one. Um, so from a time zone perspective, we, like Ash mentioned, she is in Seattle. I'm in Cleveland. Harrison and David are in Arlington, Virginia. Um, so one of the things we do is try to put things in the afternoon. So if we're having an event that's virtual across multiple campuses, it's not going to start before one o'clock. Um, because whether it's a virtual webinar series, a virtual happy hour, whatever it may be, we want to make sure that all of our partners can participate and someone's not waking up at 6 a.m. to have a coffee chat with the Nestle Pride Alliance. We do really strive to make sure that across the campuses we have um, the opportunity for anyone to join. And, and on the reverse note, if Ash is leading something out of Seattle, she's not putting it at four o'clock in Seattle time and expecting the rest of Nestle to join, um, you know, at seven o'clock our time. So we're very conscientious to make sure that we can have the maximum amount of engagement and participation possible. Perfect. So we'll go ahead and jump to the next section. Um, which is kind of looking at Pride 2020. So David did a great job talking about different programming and policies we have. Harrison talked a little bit about what we did and how we pivoted. So I wanna kind of share how we brought that to life um, and also talk about some of the product partnerships that seem to be in the chat. I am sharing my screen, so I have no idea what people are talking about in the chat. So, you know, Ash is leading that for us. Um, so if you're giving us compliments, like we just appreciate it. But anyway, I'm Nolan Andersky. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm proud to serve as one of the leaders of the Nestle Pride Alliance here at Nestle. Um, that is my gay job that I am super passionate about. I know we're stealing that from SAP or someone else here, here at the conference. Um, my day job is working in marketing innovation at Nestle. That's just a fancy way for um, saying I work on products that we'll be launching next year. I work in the modern health marketing space and product space. I can't talk about the products I'm working on in case there are other CPG friends here, um, but it is healthier, better for you types of frozen foods. Um, I've been at Nestle for four and a half years. And like I said, I sit in the Cleveland campus and super proud of Cleveland and where we are uh, as a city, um, you know, in the LGBT space as well. So shout out to any other Midwesterners. So looking at how we showed our pride, um, mainly on the Cleveland campus, uh, as everyone across the nation um, experienced prides being canceled left and right, Cleveland was really holding on to having some type of event. We're a newer city in terms of um, being out and proud of who we are and, and our LGBT center. We had a brand new one built two years ago and we have phenomenal programming that we partner uh, with them on. Um, so they had pushed it back to September and then ultimately due to COVID um, made it a virtual pride event and a, actually a socially distanced car parade. So albeit you see a picture of pride 2019, that is not 2020, we are very responsible when it comes to COVID reactions and not engaging um, in non-socially distanced events, just as a caveat for Nestle and we have HR on the line with us too. Um, so just calling that out. But one of the things we did and were so proud to do in Cleveland was participate in the car parade. Um, we had employees out in the neighborhoods that the parade was going through with signs showing support of the community. And we were able to be a gold level sponsor of Pride in the CLE, which again, we we're so thankful to do, even though we couldn't participate in our traditional format, the, the money goes to so many amazing programming in Northeast Ohio and Nestle, we're just proud to be a part of that. 
I know the question of like, do we fly our pride flags? And as you see the transgender flag of visibility up there, um, this is a snapshot outside of our Cleveland campus. So one of the things that a lot of people ask us is why don't you fly the pride flag all year round? Um, where our locations are, they are in Cleveland at least, they are considered advertising. Um, so we actually submit for a permit about six months in advance to be able to put the pride flag up. Uh, if you're in the Cleveland area and you want to drive past Nestle um, this weekend, you'll see it up for National Coming Out Day, which is on Sunday. Um, so we do permit all of those out as well. Um, the other thing that's just intriguing is that of our corporate offices, the Cleveland campus is actually the only campus that Nestle owns the property outright. So we have the ability, uh, as not lessees of a building, to promote pride in any way, shape, or form that we want to. Um, whereas unfortunately, some of our other buildings that we don't own have other tenants, and it would have to be a collective effort on those tenants, um, which it should be, and, and we're advocating for that as a camp, as a pride alliance itself. Um, but these are just such simple ways to show our pride in the areas we serve. Uh, in Cleveland, we're right on a main main road and next to a highway and you can see those pride flags flying across our campuses and our campus buildings um, and it just it, it, it warms your heart as you pull up when we used to pull up to an office space um, to see those there and we're so proud to be able to do that. So the way we looked at and I kind of talked about how we shifted pride, um, we participate in three uh, large city prides across the nation, uh, Pride in the CLE, the Capital Pride Parade, and Seattle Pride. And so one of the things that we have at Nestle is an internal creative agency, and we worked with them to come up with these amazing ideas on how do we bring pride to life. And one of the things that is always striking and so well received by our business leaders is they love to get Nestle out and about and out there, but Nestle represents 25 plus major brands that you can buy in, this, in, in your grocery stores today. And we want to work on ways to get those brands out there as well. So we've designed pride logos for our different brands to get out there. And to say that we are excited for 2021 is an understatement because we have so many fabulous ideas from 2020 that we're going to be able to take into 2021. As David noted, we were still able to create a really fun environment for our employees. And if anything, what was really nice is it actually brought our campuses together because we sit in three different campuses. And it's not that the Seattle campus has 20 people and Cleveland has, you know, 200. We have thousands of people in each campus that we oftentimes would operate as different campuses with very few events across the three campuses. Because of COVID, if you're going to take one positive thing out of a global pandemic, it's actually brought our Pride Alliance closer together to have a more unified approach that we're excited to take into 2021. So I know some people were asking about brand activations and what do we do to further our brand partnerships in the workplace? So many people don't know, but Sweet Earth Foods is actually a Nestle owned brand. Um, they, we, were, uh, we acquired them about two and a half, three years ago, and they are part of the Nestle Foods division in our portfolio of brands. One of the things we know about Sweet Earth is they over-index with the LGBTQ plus community. It's a health space brand and their consumer base often identifies with the LGBTQ plus community or as an ally base. So they said to us, you know, we participate in our Moss Landing Pride Parade. And if you're not familiar with where Moss Landing is, um, it is in the Bay Area. It's most notably known as the area where um, Big Little Lies from HBO was filmed. And our office is actually right uh, very close to um, a lot of those film scenes. So if you're ever in Moss Landing, stop by Sweet Earth. They'd love to have you. Um, but, you know, that's one little space that they were activating. And they came to the Pride Alliance and said, what can we do to showcase our support outside of the bubble that is truly that Bay Area and put out an opportunity space to show that we are partners? So one of the other things that I forgot to mention in my day job is I'm on a six month sprint team um, as an inclusive marketing consultant. So one of the things I'm working on doing with my partner, not life partner, just business partner, uh, is around how do we create a space where not just for the LGBTQ plus community, but Latinx consumers, black consumers, our Pan-Asian consumers, veterans, women-owned businesses, et cetera, how do we create an inclusive marketing space so that when you walk into a sto store and you pick up a Stouffer's, I'm already like on the next slide, but you pick up a Stouffer's package and you know that this is a brand that stands for X, Y, or Z, and it is truly a brand with purpose, not just a brand that is a part of a large conglomerate of brands and a multi-billion dollar company. So one of the things we do with Sweet Earth is say, <clears throat> 
we found a very natural partnership for them with PFLAG, which are, if you're not familiar, it's a family organization, an absolutely amazing nonprofit. Um, to partner with them and create a social media campaign for Pride Month in which users would share an image of them and the Sweet Earth product, and for every image shared, we would make a donation to PFLAG. What's really amazing about that is it's starting to build that brand awareness. The one thing we don't wanna do as a brand, and one of the pillars of our ERG is partnering with brands to make sure they're not rainbow washing. Sweet Earth could easily change their logo during June, that so many brands do, but what is behind it? And we know as out and equal attendees and advocates for our space, you don't wanna be doing that and you never wanna be the brand that does that. So Stouffer's is another brand in the Nestle portfolio. It's one of our very, very primary brands that we've had in our portfolio for decades. Um, Stouffer's was actually started in Cleveland, Ohio by the Stouffer family. Um, just a fun fact for you. But anyway, uh, Stouffer's being a multi-billion dollar brand, their main consumer is families. Um, and actually, another fun fact, Stouffer's over indexes with single white men over the age of 50. I don't know what that demographic looks like. I'm not anywhere near 50, thankfully. No, I'm just kidding, um, but I'm not. Um, so it is one of those things that, you know, that specific consumer is probably not a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Families in middle America, also not members of the LGBTQ plus community. However, we worked with Stover's to know that Gen Z is the next largest buying group that is coming up. More than half of a slightly less than half of Gen Zers identify as somewhere in the LGBTQI space. And so that consumer base, so their parents are buying Stouffer's, their grandparents are buying Stouffer's, their aunts and uncles and cousins are buying Stouffer's. So how do we start to create a natural family organization and, and connection point? So then Stouffer's isn't rainbow washing when they next year come out and say, we're going to donate to the Trevor Project. Using that as an example, if anyone from the Trevor Project is on, we're not actually making a donation from Stouffer's, would love to, um, but just as an example space, and you start to build that validity. So one of the things that Stouffer's is doing, will be doing, is partnering with the LGBT Center in Cleveland that has a lot of family programming, and it's just starting small and providing dinners for families in need or dinners for events that they're hosting. Uh, they have a queer youth program, everything of that nature. So again, it's starting to build that brand partnership very slowly so then all of a sudden two three four years from now people can look at Stouffer's and say they are an ally of the lgbtq plus community and here is why and it's because we have a track record of doing different things in that community space tivana um so ash who represents our nestle coffee partners a few years ago nest uh, Starbucks, all of Starbucks's products that you can buy in your stores um, became a part of the Nestle family. Tevana teas and coffee is being a part of that family. So one of the activation spaces, and if you're familiar with Starbucks, you know that they are out there and they are a huge supporter of the LGBTQ plus community. Nestle is striving to be that next big CPG company. We're coming for the Audis next year in 2021. So watch out Procter & Gamble half joking, but you do inspire us every day. Um, so the Family Equity Council is an organization focused on advocacy work for the LGBTQ plus community. Every year they hold a family week in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And for our international friends on the call today, Provincetown or P-Town is a huge gay community and they have an amazing pride event and huge supporters of not only LGBTQ plus members, but allies and their families. And they do that in partnership every year with Johnson & Johnson. Due to COVID-19, those plans were scratched and scrapped, um, and the in-person gathering was postponed to 2021. However, they replaced it with a Care with Pride virtual initiative that involved putting together care packages to send to 500 plus families who would have been at that family week. And in the bottom center of that very colorf colorful, vibrant photo, you see a Tivana um, canister that was able to be a part of that. So again, this is a way that we're starting to put ourselves out there and be a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Nestle as a whole, internally, fabulous. Externally, we talk about what we're doing um, in the community space and we have a Nestle Pride version of our logo, which you saw at the beginning of our presentation. And it's everything of that nature that we're kind of working towards that space. So um, what we're also working on is a lot of our brands are launching merch stores. So you see that on the left side there, um, you know, People want to buy in a very strange way a DiGiorno sweatshirt. 
I have one just because I work at Nestle. I don't know if I would buy one, but we have a large p amount of people that want to buy that. Brands are hitting up on that and they're launching these pride stores. And that's another way that we are going in and working with different brands to showcase this is a way that we're involving ourselves with the pride community and the LGBTQ plus community. And so from those merch stores that we're launching for those individual brands, we'll have pride specific items where it makes sense, of course, and a proceeds of those items will go back to organizations um, that the brand has a partnership with or deems a LGBTQ plus organization to again, start building that brand partnership. Finally, talking a little bit about the things we're doing inside of Nestle is we have 36,000 employees in the US across 34 states. And we represent just three offices and there's tons of home offices and satellite offices. How do we reach them? And so we launched this, launched this internal merchandise store that employees can get merchandise to show their pride in their well, today home office or in their office someday when we're back in that space. So again, it's just how do we get friends and family of Nestle to be promoting and showcasing their pride every day? So, some of the key takeaways, um, I'll run through this because I know we're coming up on time and I want to have time for Ash's section as well as some great questions. Um, so what worked? Inclusivity, I already talked about that. The virtual environment actually did work for us. It brought us closer together and it showed us how we were able to pivot in a true time of crisis. And like Harrison noted at the beginning of the presentation, we put our pride flags away for the first two weeks of, I mean, we still had them flying on the Solon campus, but we put them away figuratively for an event standpoint to be able to partner with the Nestle Black Employee Association and answer the call that was so much more profound in that moment and still is today, obviously. What didn't work? Budget constraints. One of the first things to go for Nestle and when we're going into a new quarter or, or a new budget period is cutting DNI. That's one of the things we're trying to work on is locking in that budget. So when we're sitting here in mid early October, we still have money to participate in certain things because that is the one thing we are trying to do as an ERG is make sure pride is an all year thing. It is not just June. And also ultimately um, swag distribution was tough because no one was in the office. Harrison you see is in the office today for the first time in seven months. Um, so obviously there's probably a lot of swag sitting on people's desks and that's just something that didn't work for us. So I want to open up to any quick questions we have before we move on to our fourth and final section. Yeah, there's definitely a few that have come through. Um, one of the ones, um, one of the ones is to give an example of where an event in particular or a collaboration in particular worked across campuses. And I, uh, Nolan, is it safe to say the the panel, the uh, the consumer panel that we did across campuses? I think that's a great example, don't you? Absolutely. So our um, LGBTQ plus consumer panel that we had uh, guests from Nike, Ahol Delhaes, um, as well as AB and Bev and Nestle participants was an absolutely amazing array of partnership across these campuses. It was a virtual event. We invested money and time to go to an external uh, platform instead of just our teams, which we normally use, to make sure that everyone had a really strong experience and it brought together all three campuses um, to one common goal. During Pride Month, we also had our Pride Call for All in which we had interviews with um, some amazing drag queens. We had some overviews of what we're doing from a pride perspective, uh, marketing updates, and it was just a really great session where people came together. It was during a cocktail hour. I mean, you can drink at any time of the day, really, but um, you know, it was during a cocktail hour, and so it was just a really, really nice uh, display of all of our campuses coming together for a common cause. Yeah, thanks for sharing that again, Nolan. Um, the second, and I think David, this might be something that either you or Harrison can speak to. Um, do we have any best practices for how we got the company to agree to include pronouns and signatures? You wanna take that, Harrison? <laughs> have they officially agreed? Um, <laughs> uh, actually, Nolan, did you work on this? I think it didn't you say you were still getting official approval? I, I have just kind of done it. So maybe I'm the wrong yeah. person. No, no. I mean, but, but I think that's how we've done. We've, we've also done a lot yeah. of things. I mean, again, it's like that courage piece. And it does, of course, I mean, I, I do think that we have a very supportive company and, and it is like with our ways of working and, and that entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, just having that, again, the courage part. Um, it, 
really, I think, gave us that that foundation to make the decisions that we need to make, whether it be, you know, being very um, prideful on our external social media where previously we, we hadn't. Um, but I think what was really key was that we knew we had to build that authenticity um, before we we did any of those kinds of things. So that, that came with the, you know, some of those donations with the, you know, in person when we could volunteer activities, you know, what were we really doing to, to tell the story that is not just, Hey, look at us during pride, but um, again, elevating those voices that, that need elevated elevation. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that was just a key piece of just having to decide and, and do it. Yeah, uh, I will second that. It's, it's definitely been um, very grassroots. We're seeing some of that in the chat as well. Um, it's definitely been something we did just kicked off. Um, we do have a strong uh, executive sponsor, I, and I think that helps. Mm -hmm. um, we also have had anecdotally really great responses from our field sales teams who've seen these pronouns in the signature. So. Um, I'm going to segue into the next question and tie it into this one. One of the questions we got was, how do we get uh, folks who are not sitting physically on any of these campuses pre-COVID? How do we get them to engage with our events? Um, I can speak to that from a Nestle Coffee Partners standpoint, for sure. Um, more than 50% of the Coffee Partners workforce is field-based. So like Nolan and Harrison and David mentioned, they're either in home offices or they're field sales folks or they are in smaller satellite offices. And I think for us, being able to reach them through um, technology has really helped. Um, being able to have more of this grassroots swell of, hey, um, let's build in signatures, let's have virtual ways and touch points where people don't have to, it's not a heavy lift to include a signature. And if you get your wrist slapped, you get your wrist slapped, and then you go back and change it. So it feels like a low risk effort within the Nestle environment to do that. Um, I will also say within the Nestle Coffee Partners uh, Pride Alliance, we, we have um, an official field outreach role and there's been a lot of enthusiasm for people who are based in the field who do want to engage with, uh, with the board and with the BRG, with the ERG, um, and we definitely take advantage of that when it comes out. Awesome. Well, I think let's run to the next section. Yeah. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is intersectionality. Um, my name is Ash Glover Ganapati Raju, in, in case you're wondering how to pronounce that. Um, I use the she, her, her pro pronouns. Um, and I work in product marketing at Nestle, specifically at Nestle Coffee Partners. Um, like Nolan mentioned, we came over with, I was part of the crew that came over with that um, Starbucks CPG products moving over to Nestle. We are, if the ERG itself is about two years old, we are by far the youngest portion of that ERG. So it's been phenomenal to be able to lean on, uh, on leaders across campuses like Harrison, David and Nolan to be able to um, brainstorm questions and, and essentially use each other as means of support, uh, even pre-COVID. What I want to speak to, if you will move to the next slide, Nolan, what I want to speak to, like I said, is this, this whole reckoning with our own intersectionality that we've had to, um, had to undergo as an ERG. I think Harrison set this up really well at the start, right? Like we knew that for us, being um, being able to provide more visibility to our BIPOC members, being able to be truly intersectional in the way that we were approaching programming or events or uh, policy changes, that's always been on the radar for us and a goal for us. Really what Black Lives Matter and COVID did was, was accelerate that process pretty significantly. Um, I want to speak to two specific incidents. The first is coming into June 1st, we knew we couldn't go on with programming as it was. We knew that we would have to do something different and stand up as allies while supporting a community that uh, we felt needed to be spotlighted. So it was we didn't feel like it was the right thing to do was to go on as if nothing had happened. And, uh, Part of the power for us was leaning on that value of courage that we had. And it really, all it takes 
is just one person, in this case, Harrison and David, saying, hey, I think we have to say the words Black Lives Matter. Knowing that we are an ERG with a strong sponsor, there's definitely, we have tailwinds in our favor, but it's hard sometimes when you're in a big company to, to come to a consensus as an organization to, uh, or to wait for leaders to hand that statement down. And I think that's where our, uh, we are incredibly proud of the work that we're doing as an ERG because that's the, being able to put out a statement that says, hey, silence is not okay and black lives really matter and we are going to stand and spotlight our, our um, black employee association it really helped us show up as leaders and helped i think leadership get a pulse for what um what people and employees in the organization were, were looking for the second that I want to spotlight is a movie discussion, and this one definitely hit home. Um, my partners here on the call have heard this story a few times now. We did, um, I'm equal, put out a guide on Pride events, so we definitely stole this idea of a, a movie club from the guide that um, I'm equal put out. And we chose Pariah and we co hosted a panel with the Black Employee Association and Nestle Purina, was, which is its own operating unit. Um, and as we were two days before we came up, we said, hey, everyone go watch this movie. And if you're interested in participating in a discussion, just hop on at so and so time. Um, and we expected it to be really, really easy going, right? It's a movie. And as an ERG, I think oftentimes we um, approach this as, hey, we are in this for, the for a fight for equality. So inherently, there is something inclusive about what we are doing. Um, but two days before the, the panel, um, someone from our Purina counterparts called us and, and it was such an uncomfortable conversation because one of the things that came up was someone viewing the movie felt like Pariah had a lot of negative black stereotypes. I think what helped us and where we learned and we grew through our discomfort was to sit with that discomfort of having that dialogue and to to be really authentic in the panel to say, hey, this came up and, and have open out that dialogue to the panelists and to us as ERG leads to say, hey, what does that really mean for us? And why is this inclusive versus not? Why is this important versus not as a narrative? And I think the other thing that continue to do, Nolan, if you want to move to the next slide, is it paved the way for some really authentic conversations um, where we were able to lean on our diversity and inclusion team to hold listening sessions and to do really quick partnerships with other ERGs. So we absolutely believe that partnerships across ERGs are really the only way to approach, um, approach inclusion in a holistic way. Um, it also led to us launching this book club on um, that actually Harrison led, um, or where we read um, as a group, if this was an opt-in activity, you, you read how to be an anti-racist and came together for discussions. And once, once again, this goes back to just an act of individual courage. It takes just one person to say, I'm going to do this, come on board. And there are more voices than not that are willing to engage in the dialogue, which given, especially today, the polarized environment we move in, creating a space where we can engage respectfully in that dialogue as an ERG creating that space, I think it's, it's the best thing we've been able to do. In the last minute, I'm gonna go with the last slide. Um, our vision is to continue a lot of this good work that we've been doing to create a higher level of visibility for our BIPOC and um, trans, queer, intersex um, plus members of the ERG, strengthening our allyship, both showing up as allies and recruiting people who may not be part of the community but are willing to speak up and take a stance. I think these are, these are definitely future goals for us and we've created a really strong foundation to be able to go off of them this year. Okay, with that, last three things we're going to leave you with. This is a summation of everything you've heard. Courage, it just takes one person. Um, 
Virtual can really be inclusive. There is a lot of ways to, to make virtual program inclusive, recording things, relying on technology, being able to find time zones that work for everyone, especially for key programming. And then the last one, this one's a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, we say have a plan C. Our first plan was to just do um, mirroring events across campuses and that fell through with COVID. And once we had a plan for COVID, we had to go fix another plan for uh, showing up in the context of the current cultural moment. Um, we're at time, so what we're going to say is if you want to reach out to any of us, thank you so much for your, spending your afternoon with us today, but if you want to reach out to any of us, feel free to email us at NPA at us.nestle.com. This is our Pride ERG mailbox, and one of us will make sure to get back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for spending time with Thank us. Thank you.